nation's capital, the Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. We're going to be talking during this program about communist China as America prepares to witness the forthcoming Olympics to be held in communist China this summer. Whenever I think of these Olympics, I recall the 1936 Olympics that were held in Nazi Germany. It was my privilege to know Jesse Owens, a great American who stole the show uh, and confounded Adolf Hitler uh, by winning a race that he was not expected to win. And uh, Jesse Owens was a great American patriot. He and I became good friends. This was during the Nixon administration when I was in charge of federal youth programs. And looking back on the 1936 Olympics, I can't imagine that Franklin Delano Roosevelt would permit himself to be seated next to Adolf Hitler and helping Hitler derive uh, political strength and support from his Olympics. But now we have President George Bush with Hu Jintao doing everything he can to help the communist Chinese advance their Olympic agenda. We're privileged to have as our guest for this broadcast Keith Ware, who has suffered not just the slings and arrows, but the beatings administered by the Red Chinese. Keith, tell me about your experiences in China and what brought you there. Well, <clears throat> I am a Falun Gong practitioner. And uh, for those who don't know what a Falun Gong practitioner is or what Falun Gong is, Falun Gong is a meditation or a Qigong practice that was introduced to the public in 1992. It's an ancient practice, but the public only got to know it in 1992. Now, I know that it has ancient credentials because when I visited uh, China, I saw uh, countless numbers of people engaged publicly in meditation and exercise, a very common practice. Continue. Well, from 1992 um, to 1999, over 100 million people started practicing Falun Gong because it was, so, it was indeed so powerful. What do the words mean, Falun Gong? Falun Gong is uh, law wheel, uh, energy law wheel in a, a literal translation. And... Uh, but it was uh, brought to the public by uh, Master Li Hongzhi. And uh, this time, when it was brought to the public, everything was put into a book. So unlike other practices where it might get watered down because I teach you, you teach ten, they teach ten, and so on, everybody has to learn from the same source. So it's like McDonald's. If you uh, are working at McDonald's, you all know how to cook the hamburger the same Ex way. Exactly correct. So if you're living in Australia, Wisconsin, or Washington, D.C., you're learning the exact same information in the exact same way so that there's no um, dilution of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of the practice. Well, it was so popular that from 1992 to 1999, 100 million people started practicing. Well, that was the great news. The bad news is 100 million people started practicing. And as you know, if anybody uh, or if a lot of people are doing the same thing in communist China, that by itself is a threat against the, uh, against the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, which I might add, uh, which we hopefully can discuss later, which is the biggest cult in the world, uh, if you have a chance, the opportunity to read nine commentaries. Well... They, because 100 million people uh, are practicing and only 60 million registered communists, um, Jiang Zemin had to take a stand and he had to say, okay, we got to stop this somehow. So, at Jiang that, Zemin <clears throat> was the predecessor to Hu Jintao as the number one guy in the so called People's Republic of China. Absolutely. He was the dictator at that point. And he single-handedly started the persecution of Falun Gong at that time. And uh, he created what was then known as the, the, um, the, the situation on, on Tiananmen Square where five, the self-immolation incident, uh, five people set themselves on fire and he claimed that they were Falun Gong practitioners. Yeah. Tiananmen Square, for our younger viewers, 
was the place where for the first time in a long time, in a visible way, there were public protests against the Chinese communist regime. Absolutely. And the Chinese communists uh, were very intolerant of the protests and ran people over with tanks. This is not myth. This was on uh, news programs, on film all over the world. Well, that, that's a very important point you brought up about the, uh, the, the, uh, the crackdown for the democratic uh, movement. There is a very good friend of mine that hopefully one day you all might be able to interview. And she came, she's Chinese, and she came to America. And when the Americans, her American friends, told her about the, the crackdown and the, the massacre at that point, she became very angry because the CCP closely monitors all media, newspapers, radio, and television. And... It was her strong belief, because her government would never lie to her, it was her strong belief that the, the military went to Tiananmen Square to protect the students, and it was her belief that the students turned against the military and started killing the, the, the military, because the only images she saw were images of uh, soldiers being killed and soldiers on fire and... and but, uh, and images of the, the, the military supposedly trying to protect the people. And, of course, when she ultimately learned the truth, she became very angry with Were you government. there at that time? I was not there at that time. I was nowhere near China at that time. I, I was in China in, let's see, about 2003 is when I went to China uh, for the... The, the Chinese New Year, uh, I was there. And, um, it, well, it's a long story where <clears throat> I was very upset with the persecution going on in China. How did you learn about it? Well, I learned firsthand because uh, I, as a Falun Gong practitioner, uh, Jiang Zemin began the crackdown began the persecution. You're now about 50 years old. I am 50 years old. How the, old were you when you became a Falun Gong practitioner? Well, it was just about eight and a half years ago, so I was about 42. Yeah. Now, you have, you're not of uh, uh, Chinese heritage, personally, your family's not from China. What led you to Falun Gong? Oh, that's very easy. On uh, New Year's Day, oh, I'm sorry, on New Year's Day, of the, uh, the, the year 2000, the, the big Y2K scare where the earth was supposed to explode. Um, or something like or that. Or something like that. Well, um, my wife and I took a walk on to the National Mall. And uh, I have been a practitioner. In Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C. And I have been a practitioner of, of quite a few things all my life. That includes things like uh, different Qigongs, uh, um, different karates and, and uh, um, kung fus, etc. So I was a very diligent practitioner of many things. So you're a very, physically, you're a very physically fit man, and you have been throughout your life. You, you're a very accomplished mountain climber, among other things. I am indeed a, 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 a mountain climber. of uh, for, for the longest time, I was one of the few black mountain climbers in the United States capable of leading an expedition to the summit of Mount Everest. I, I never made, had that opportunity. As a matter of fact, a, a funny story, uh, well, not so funny story, the, the big expedition to Mount Everest where everybody died. and I everybody recall. Hurt. Well, I'm very, very familiar with that expedition. I was invited to help uh, work that expedition, but... Uh, it just so happened I was too busy, and I could you not You did do it. Mount Kilimanjaro. I did do Mount Kilimanjaro, um, uh, uh, a mountain of much uh, different uh, technological skill. Mm -hmm. But uh, two weeks after I came back, uh, after the last person died on, on Everest that, uh, on that particular trip, I received a postcard from Rob Hall. The, the last guy who died two weeks afterwards saying, wish you were here, you know. <laughs> and it was stamped from the base camp of Mount Everest. I still have that card today. So, um, no, I don't wish I was there, but I'm, and I'm glad to this day that I'm not. But um, 
I have been a mountain climber, and so I've been physically fit and practiced several things. We're going to have to take a break in, uh, in a minute or so. I want to learn what your concerns are about the Olympics and what you're going to do about it and uh, whether it is feasible for people who don't want to see communist China uh, get a uh, boost to their image around the world as a result of the Olympics. This is a regime which has extraordinary human rights violations, which is building up its military to the point where it threatens us at sea, in the air, and in space. Uh, this is a regime which limits the ability of people to have more than one child, uh, and unless they're very well connected mm -hmm. and are willing to pay off Absolutely. people to have other children. I want to uh, learn from you firsthand uh, what uh, you have to say about plans to limit uh, the exploitation of the world by the red Chinese regime in the context of the Olympics. My pleasure. Please stay with us. I'll be back with Keith Ware right after these messages. One of the top leaders in the communist Chinese military declared that the United States is the main enemy of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the People's Republic of China, which is longhand for what we call China. Uh, we have been building up uh, our enemy, if that is a reciprocal term, by giving them most favored nation status and membership in the World Trade Organization. Last year alone, that gave them an $84 billion advantage in uh, money which is fungible. And uh, as a result of the extra money they have, they're not only taking jobs from the United States, they're increasing their military budget by 17% a year. It's time to stop sending technology and dollars to communist China. The Conservative Caucus, www.conservativeusa.org or 703-938-9626. Here's how you can become a citizen lobbyist and influence how your representatives vote. Write a letter to your congressmen and senators. Speak out on a call-in talk radio program. Write a letter to the editor of your local newspaper and call the Conservative Caucus for more information at 703-938-9626. More than the entire population of Cincinnati, more than all the men and women in the Marine Corps, more than four times the number of unemployed auto workers. Since 1980, over half a million Americans who make clothing and home fashions have lost their jobs because we don't realize the impact of buying imported goods. So if you think looking for the Made in the USA label doesn't matter, Next! It matters. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these conservative roundtable broadcasts. Our guest <coughs> for this broadcast is Keith Ware, who describes himself as a fourth generation, east of the river, resident of Washington, D.C. He is a practitioner of Falun Gong, which he has been practicing for more than eight years. He and his African-American wife were the first blacks to be beaten detained and arrested on Tiananmen Square. And he's now a reporter on the Sound of Hope radio network. Well, tell me about the circumstances that led to your beating. Well, as I said before, we were um, practitioners and we uh, decided to tell the truth uh, in China of what's going on uh, uh, to the, uh, about their own persecution. Because one of the things that happens in China is because they control the media, Everybody in China believes that Falun Gong is persecuted everywhere in the world. Well, if we could go there and show the people of China that, no, it's, it's legal everywhere in the world except China, then it would make people start scratching their heads. And so I contacted quite a few friends of mine from around the world, and we all agreed to meet in Tiananmen Square at a certain time. Well, um, little did we know that here in Washington, D.C., for me, since I was organizing this, 
that the Chinese embassy, according to the FBI, had been uh, tapping my phones, bugging my house, uh, and uh, stealing my emails. So they knew, they were well aware of my intentions to come to China in the first place. But I was still a bit baffled because the night before Did, we did went, you need a visa to get there? Yes, they, uh, they granted me a visa. And I, I have to admit that I thought I was going to be stopped at, at the border, at least stopped at the border and uh, kicked out right then. But they had, it couldn't have been easier. I, I landed in China and we walked right through. You landed in Beijing? We went straight to Beijing airport. It was around midnight. And we walked right off the plane, didn't barely stop through customs, and uh, grabbed my bags and walked out. And we went to the hotel, and uh, we, were, we were always advised that some of the rooms may be bugged there, which made me very, very confused. And uh, uh, when about 10 policemen busted into our hotel room uh, that night, and they, the first question they asked is, are you doing Falun Gong? And as Falun Gong practitioners, under no circumstances are we allowed to lie, even if our own lives are in danger. And, of course, I quickly responded by saying, what's Falun Gong? And that's all I said. And then he went into this explanation. And the reason why I was confused is come to find out uh, uh, a long time later, they were looking for me. The, he was looking for me, and those 10 policemen backed out of the room later on and went pounding on the door next to me, and I heard some more. Because you confused them with your response. I, I, I can't tell you why I confused them or how I confused <laughs> them, but I know they were looking for the person who, was, who organized this whole thing, and they, they knew that I did it, but apparently not. Well, the, the important thing is the next day when my wife and I planned to go to, to Tiananmen Square, we were at this point very concerned uh, about what was happening. And so we went very early in the morning. Nobody was on Tiananmen Square. So we went back at the, the time that we were scheduled to be there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on, on uh, February 15th, as a matter of fact. And as we were approaching Tiananmen Square, every policeman um, checked our bags to look for Falun Gong paraphernalia, and we figured that might happen. And we got checked about three or four times, and we made it on to Tiananmen. Why are the communists so afraid of Falun Gong? You're, you're, you're an organization which focuses on meditation. That is correct. Prayer. What frightens them? Um, the numbers and the fact that we, we have three main beliefs, truth, compassion, and tolerance. And, in fact, in my pocket, I did have a flag uh, a yellow flag that's in Chinese that said truth, compassion, and tolerance, nothing else. <laughs> and um, we, uh, we made it onto Tiananmen Square, and uh, I noticed that every Chinese person at that time I saw was an undercover policeman. They're not very, <laughs> they're very obvious at, at that point. Well, we got to uh, uh, the, the meeting place and nobody was there. Well, oh, well, we were very concerned what happened. And we saw a few people that we were supposed to meet up with, and they said they've already been arrested. And so my wife and I, at that point, made the decision that we were going to hold up our banner that said truth, compassion, and tolerance. Uh, or as you say in, uh, in Chinese, it's zhen shan zhen. Well, those three words go against every single thing that the Chinese Communist Party or the CCP believes in. That is why they're afraid. They're afraid that the, uh, there are 100 million Falun Gong practitioners and 60 million registered communists. That is why they're afraid. They're afraid that people will have independent thinking because under no circumstance will a Falun Gong practitioner tell, uh, tell a lie, which, by the way, is how they find Falun Gong practitioners. People always ask me, why don't they just practice in the house and, and not practice out in the public? Well, if you create what I call funnel points, people getting off of a bus, walking out of a building, and you have a policeman standing there just simply asking, are you a Falun Gong practitioner? And assuming that you must a answer the question yes or no, well, he has to answer yes. And, of course, at that point, they'll say, come with me. You, the rest of your life is planned with us. And so <clears throat> uh, 
so that is why they are they are afraid. So we went on to Tiananmen Square, and uh, my wife and I held out a banner that said "Truth, Compassion, and Tolerance." And I'd say about seven seconds after that uh, banner was un unfurled, uh, I had about ten policemen on top of me, and she had probably an equal amount of policemen on top of her. And um, she, we were thrown into a, uh, a policeman van, ultimately. And the most incredible thing ever happened. Uh, I see what compassion can actually do. Uh, there were people on top of my wife, you know, pinning her down. She was on her back in the van. And um, she reached up with her free hand and touched them. And she was trying to tell them, you don't have to be afraid of me. And, you know, of course... Macho, manly, studly, virile Keith was trying to tell him, unhand her, unhand her. And she turned to me and said, Keith, shut up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but the policemen who she was calming down, they became so afraid of her that they didn't know what to do. When the police van pulled out, they jumped out and said, like, get her away from me. You know, I, they didn't want to touch her. And I just observed what genuine compassion can do. And another strange thing happened while we were being beaten on Tiananmen Square. I, of course, was in my world, and I'll, all of a sudden, all I heard was someone screaming. And it was my wife uh, screaming, obviously. And I said, what are they doing to her? What are they doing to her? And finally, I focused in on what she was saying. And she was yelling to the crowd that was forming. You know, which is what I should have been doing. She was talking to them in Chinese. She was telling them, I am an American. We, I practice Falun Gong, and it's legal. She was trying to tell them everything. And they were scratching their heads. How can that be? How can these people be, you know, Americans, and how can they practice Falun Gong? And when I was being interrogated, um, quite a few unusual things happened. I was able to talk to them, and I, I was getting frustrated with them. And I said, what do, they, what do they teach you to lie? And the answer was yes, they do teach us to lie, because they would ask me, force me to go from one place to another, and I would resist. And they said, oh, you'll see your wife there, or you can, you'll have something to eat. And, you know, of course it was a lie every time. But I talked to them and said, no, you, you, you don't have to lie. It's not... You don't have to. What should be done about the Olympics? The Olympics, very good question. Um, the Olympics is um, something that we are putting something together called the Human Rights Torch Relay. It's actually already started, and um, it's a torch that is going around the world like the Olympic torch is going around the world to let pe the, the people of the world know that... China is masking their human rights violations. As a matter of fact, it's due to arrive in America. The, this human rights torch is due to arrive in Boston on March 30th and go across the United States. It's uh, scheduled to be in Washington, D.C. around the second week, in, second Thursday in April, and we invite everybody to come out. Unfortunately, the, uh, uh, China has a very big stronghold in America in one spot. San Francisco. They have quite a few allies, business and uh, home comrades. It, that's interesting because Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, represents a part of San Francisco in Congress, and she's been a rather outspoken friend of Free China, of Taiwan. And apparently there's a large Free Chinese population there as well. Absolutely. And so the Olympic torch <clears throat> is stopping in one spot in America for one day and one day only. And so uh, in San Francisco, probably Chinatown to be specific. Grand because, Avenue. <laughs> absolutely. And because it has protection from the protesters. Now, one thing that the Conservative Caucus has been talking about is producing copies of the Declaration of Independence in Mandarin mm -hmm. and asking people who are going to China for the Olympics to distribute the U.S. Declaration of Independence. Keith, we have to take a break. Sure. We'll be right back for a final segment right after these messages.
Find out how you can support freedom in China, protect your family from poisoned food and products from China, and save American jobs. Go to conservativeusa.org for information and actions you can take. This has been a public service of the Conservative Caucus. Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors this and other conservative roundtable programs now being seen in more than 120 communities across America. If you want to learn more about the work of the Conservative Caucus, check out our website, uh, www.conservativeusa.org. Keith, in the time remaining, Mm -hmm. how can people learn more about what you're doing and plug into it? Tell us about Sound of Hope Radio and the Torch activity. Yeah, the Sound of Hope Radio Network is one of the the biggest radio networks that broadcasts into China. And uh, we also have the uh, uh, something called the Internet Project, where we have broken through the Chinese uh, firewall, and we get more information into and out of China than anybody else, including the, the, the U.S. government. And, um, but we need help to continue those. So we're trying to get the, those projects completely funded so that we can uh, completely break down the, the CCP and let people know that the CCP is controlling their What lives. is your big plan for the Olympics? The, the big plan of the Olympics is, is again, the, uh, the human rights torch relay, uh, the, the coalition to investigate the uh, persecution of Falun Gong is trying to promote, the, let people know what is going on so people can see a lot, uh, what's going on. Some people are trying to uh, boycott the Olympics, uh, and uh, we'll support those people who are boycotting the Olympics, but we want everybody to have the true information of what's going on. Keith Ware, it's been a pleasure meeting you and having you on the broadcast. Thank you for joining us on Conservative Roundtable. We'll see you next time.